By the end of this video, you'll be ready to jump into a branch of mathematics called group theory. One of the big ideas in an abstract algebra class is to take a set and study what happens when you put a binary operation on it. That is a well-defined way to combine elements of the set that results in another element of the set. We're gonna look at three examples of this. The first example we'll look at are the integers mod n with addition. Now, in case you don't remember what the integers mod n are, we're taking two integers and saying they're equivalent to each other whenever n divides the difference b minus a. Now that means b minus a is a multiple of n. If we take n equals three and sketch out some integers on the number line, what we're saying is any two integers that are three units apart go into the same basket. If you think about it, that means that there are three possible baskets. Also, a mathier name for basket is an equivalence class. So once we've put all the integers into their respective baskets, we gotta figure out what do we name these baskets? And it's typical just to name them whatever the remainder is when you divide by three. So we'll name them zero, one, and two. And these three elements form the set Z3. Now to practice reducing something, say y is 17 equivalent to two mod three, just go ahead and divide 17 by three and you see the remainder is two. So 17 goes in the blue basket. We can add these equivalence classes, or in other words, the baskets. The A basket plus the B basket just gives you the basket that has A plus B. In other words, A mod N plus B mod N should just be A plus B then mod N. So for example, if we do 10 mod 12 plus 7 mod 12, just do 10 plus 7, divide by 12, and the remainder is your answer. We can visualize this by drawing a clock and treat clockwise as the positive direction. Also, where 12 usually is, we'll put 0. Now, if you start at 10 and jump 7 times in the positive direction, you end up at 5. Another way to look at the algebra that we did is to use what's called the division algorithm, which says, find the biggest multiple of 12 that doesn't go over your number. That is equivalent to zero, and what you're left with is the remainder. In example two, we'll keep Zn, but now consider multiplying equivalence classes in sort of the obvious way, just multiply the representatives. For example, if you want to do four mod 12 times four mod 12, you should just multiply four times four. This says we're going to make four clockwise jumps of four units, and we land back at four. Example three is some set D3 with function composition. Now, what is this? Let's take an equilateral triangle with vertices A, B, and C. The bijections from A, B, C to itself are called permutations. Now, some of these permutations are rotations of the triangle, and some of them are reflections of the triangle, such that the relative distance between points is preserved, and the relative position of the points is preserved. These types of rotations and reflections are called rigid motions. For our triangle, we have six of them, and what we're gonna do now is try to visualize each one. First, consider the identity permutation. We'll denote this function by ID, and observe that it just maps each vertex to itself. The matrix form is a convenient way to write a permutation, where you just put the inputs in the top row and the corresponding outputs in the bottom row. The second permutation we'll consider is row one, which sends vertex A to B, B to C, and C to A. As you'll see, this is a 120 degrees clockwise rotation of the triangle. The third permutation we'll consider is row two, which sends A to C, B to A, and C to B. This is a 240 degrees clockwise rotation of the triangle. The fourth permutation we'll look at is mu one, which sends A to A, B to C, and C to B. This corresponds to a reflection over the altitude that extends from the bottom left vertex. The fifth permutation we'll look at is mu2 that sends A to C, B to B, and C to A. This corresponds to a reflection over the altitude that extends from the top vertex of the triangle. We'll denote the sixth and final permutation by mu3. This sends A to B, B to A, and C to C. This corresponds to a reflection over the altitude that extends from the bottom right vertex of the triangle. Now, the equilateral triangle is kind of nice because all six of the permutations were symmetries of the triangle, but this is not necessarily true for all shapes. For example, there are four factorial equal 24 permutations of four vertices, but only eight of these are rigid motions of a square. Okay, back to the triangle. We'll name the set of functions that we just finished animating D3. 
you can check that composing any two functions in D3 still gives us an element of D3. For example, let's look what mu1 composed with row1 does to each vertex. Now you'd plug A into row1 first, and that's B, and now mu1 takes B to C. Similarly, mu1 composed with row1 takes B to B, and finally, mu1 composed with row1 takes C to A. Now let's try to visualize what this composition is doing. Remember, you start with the right function in a composition. Well, row one takes our triangle and rotates it 120 degrees clockwise. And then mu one is a reflection over the altitude that extends from the bottom left vertex. But notice this just boils down to a reflection over the altitude that extends from the top vertex. That's what we called mu two. Now let's compare some of the algebraic properties of the binary operations on each of the sets that we've considered so far. And to do this, we're going to make what we'll tentatively call a multiplication table for each binary operation. Let's start with addition on Z4. Notice it's commutative, meaning that it doesn't matter what order you add in. In other words, 1 plus 2, which is 3 mod 4, that should be the same thing as 2 plus 1. Next, observe that addition is associative, meaning if you're adding three things together, it doesn't matter which two you add first. For example, if I add 1 plus 2 first and then add 1, I get 0 mod 4, but that should be the same thing as if I added the 1s first and then added 2. The element 0 is an identity for this algebraic structure. That means when you add 0 to any element a, you should just get a back. Finally, this algebraic structure has inverses. That just means that you can always undo the operation. A fancier way to say that is that the equation a plus x is congruent to 0 mod 4 always has a solution. And you can see 0 is its own inverse, 1 and 3 are inverses, and 2 is its own inverse. Next, let's look at z4 with multiplication. First, multiplication is commutative, again, meaning that you can multiply in either order. 2 times 3 should be the same thing as 3 times 2, even when you look at things mod 4. Next, multiplication is associative. When you multiply three things together, it doesn't matter which two you multiply first. Again, two times the quantity three times two is the same thing as two times three, then times two. Either way, you're gonna get zero mod four. Next, the element one is an identity for this algebraic structure. It means when you take any element a and multiply by one, you should just get a back. Also, since the structure is commutative, there's no need to check that 1 times a also gives you a. Now something a little more interesting. This algebraic structure does not necessarily always have inverses. In other words, you can't always undo multiplication. a times x is congruent to 1 mod 4 need not have a solution. You can't undo multiplying by 0. But even if you take away 0, a non-zero element like 2 does not have a multiplicative inverse. You can see this pretty quickly in the table. We never get a 1 in this highlighted red row. The last example would be our symmetries of our triangle with function composition. Now right off the bat, composition is not necessarily commutative. Notice mu1 composed with row1 is mu2, but when I switch the order, you get mu3. Function composition is associative. When you compose three functions, it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. And just to demonstrate how you do that in the table, notice that when you first do row two compose with mu one and then compose with row one, you get mu one. And next, when you compose row one and row two, that gives you the identity. So that compose with mu one is mu one. Hey, speaking of the identity, when you compose any of these functions f with the identity on either side, you just get f back. So this function id for composition works the same way as 0 does for addition and how 1 does for multiplication. Finally, this algebraic structure has inverses. You can always undo composing a function with f. And you can observe this because there is an id in every single row. And for example, this says mu2 is its own inverse. Here's a summary of our observations. Now, sort of like a biologist names classes of animals and says these animals belong to this class because they share certain characteristics, mathematicians name classes of algebraic structures and they say these algebraic structures belong to this class because they share certain characteristics. Arguably, the most studied class of algebraic structures 
is called a group. The characteristics that an algebraic structure should have to be a group are that the operation is associative, there's an identity, and that there are inverses. So the big red no says Zn with multiplication is not a group, whereas the neutral blue color is trying to indicate that some groups are commutative and some groups are non-commutative. Finally, group theory is the study of what you can derive by taking as axioms that your algebraic structure is associative, has an identity, and always has inverses. And now you, my friend, are ready to go derive some stuff about group theory.